Hi, this is Ben Garber with Virginia Market Ready. On July 19th, Matt Ludwig and I traveled to T&E Meats, a meat processing plant in Harrisonburg, Virginia. T&E has been locally owned and operated since 1939, and they serve meat producers from across the region. We were there to talk with Joe Cloud, general manager and co-owner at T&E. Joe talked with us about the evolution of T&E as a business, his experiences working with farmers who market directly to the consumer, and the legal, ethical, and food safety issues present in meat processing. Let's take a look. So I'm here today with uh, Mr. Joe Cloud, T&E Meats. Mr. Cloud, just tell us a little bit about yourself and about T&E as a company. We just passed our ninth anniversary. Joel Salatin, my partner, and I purchased the company in, on July 1st, 2008. We purchased it from the May family, and they had been running it for about 35 years. They did slaughter, and they became USDA inspected because uh, they had to be to sell the meat, and they had a fresh sausage business that they really focused on. Uh, when we purchased it, we purchased it to, for the local food movement, if you will. To, we saw that the, the business proposition was to do a lot more slaughter and, and cutting and packing and, and processing for the local farmers, the, uh, the folks that were direct marketing their own uh, branded local meats. And it took us about four years to kind of steer that ship around bit by bit and to grow up the direct processing that we were doing and we've more than doubled that. So we're, we've been growing our direct processing market about roughly 15% a year ever since 2008. So that's, and, and that's what we do. And as we've been doing it, we've been getting better and better at it, uh, getting a better team, better trained, getting better used to what we were doing, buying in a lot more machinery that's, that's much better, the stuff that we inherited, just improving our quality. For me, this was a, I'm a mid-career professional, I guess. I was about 50 when I purchased this plant and it began running it. I have no background in the meat industry at all. I have a degree in biology, and then I have a, a master's in landscape architecture from Harvard University. It's a little bit different than what we do here. But I worked for, for a private, a large private consulting firm for about 20 years. I grew up on a farm. I love food. I was very interested in this. I was interested in making a change for family reasons. It was just another big complex project to manage, so I figured I could do it. And, and we've done all right. I've done all right. We, I, I, you're learning stuff every day. The meat business is incredibly complicated, mm -hmm. very highly regulated, very capital intensive. It's very machine oriented. You know, you have to think about the marketing. You have to think about the regulations. You have to think about the production quality. You have to think about your personnel issues. It's, there's a lot going on all the time, so it keeps me on my toes. I believe it. To key off something you said, t and &E is USDA inspected. What does that mean and why is it? In America, since about 1906, after the Upton Sinclair published The Jungle and caused a lot of concern about the quality of the meat supply, Business fell off so bad for all the big packers out in Chicago and Cincinnati and where they were mainly headquartered at the time, that they basically went to the Congress and said, we're asking you to regulate us because we want to show consumers that we are working hard to produce a clean, wholesome product. And it was basically a measure to boost consumer confidence. And so the Red Meat Inspection Act was passed. The taxpayer pays for meat inspection. The inspectors come into the plant and they inspect the meat. They, they create the basic rules of it, although today that's changed. I mean, we control our destiny a lot more through our own HACCP plans, which are food safety plans. But every single package that goes out of here, or whether it's a whole carcass or it's a packaged meat, has our market inspection on it, which is our establishment number. We are establishment number 7420. Every meat plant in America has its own establishment number. Every animal that's slaughtered is slaughtered in the presence of an inspector. The inspectors come through our plant every day. We have specific hours of inspection and we can't lose outside of those hours because those are the hours that the inspectors know that we're processing. So that market inspection is basically a quality assurance, a means of quality assurance for the, for the consumer, but it's also a tracking mechanism. So when you hear about a, a recall, if there's ever a, a meat recall, yeah, it's a, it's a basic tracking number. 
And again, because of the U.S. Constitution and the Commerce Clause, the state-level inspection, which is roughly equal to a USDA inspection, but you can only sell that meat within the state. If you want to, if you want the meat across state lines, you've got to have USDA inspection. That means you've got to have your inspection system working together with the with FISIS, the Food Safety Inspection System, which is um, just a department or a division within the USDA that does the meat inspection. We have a number of customers that do sell across state lines. They go particularly up into Maryland and into D.C., so it's important that they have access to that distribution capability. And from a producer standpoint, whether you're a USDA inspector or not, is going to be based on which processing you use. Not, somebody couldn't come here and say, I only want something state inspected. That's it. Processor by processor basis? That's correct. On the state inspection, yeah, we don't have, so our labels are all USDA. They don't have state of Virginia labels, but we actually do two kinds of processing. We do our inspected processing, but we also do what's commonly known as custom processing, also known as locker meat. And that means that the meat that goes out is only for you can bring me a hog and say, I don't need it done under inspection. This is just going to be for me and my family. I'm going to take it home and put it in my freezer. So they call that locker beef or locker pork. Mm-hmm. And all of those packages go out. They've got a not for sale sticker on them. They don't have the inspection sticker. Mm-hmm. It saves you some money. Say you're a small scale farmer and you raise maybe five or ten head of cattle a year. And you sell them to your friends, to your family members, to people at church. I may never, I never even need to see those people. You can raise the animals, you can bring them to me, and then you can pick them up and take them and deliver them to me. I need to know who that meat is going to. I need to have a name. I need to have an address. All of that meat goes out in the boxes are clearly marked. They don't have your name on it. They have the individual who owns that at the time that you bring those animals to me, maybe you bring me five beef and you have five different customers who each own one that have, are going to buy that beef from you, then the inspection system's understanding those individuals each own one of those animals. It belongs to them. And that's a good business model, actually, for a lot of our customers. What are the different markings and labels on the meat? If you just go out of it's a carcass, it's just going to have our round USDA symbol mm-hmm. stamped on a few places on that carcass. You'll see the number. We also do some exotics. So the red meat, you get free inspection for pork, for beef, for lamb, and for goats. That's the basic red meat inspection act. But we also have slaughtered American bison, mm-hmm. Asian water buffalo, alpacas, yaks. I have a yak breeder that brings them to me now. And alpaca is not considered an exotic, but those other three are understood to be exotic animals. And you, as a producer, could bring them to me. I can stamp them right with a triangular stamp. If you ever okay. buy, if you ever buy bison, or, you know American buffalo in the in the store, and you can do that now in any large grocery store. You'll notice that the stamp is a triangle; it's not a circle, and that means it's done under voluntary inspection. And you have to pay for the inspector's time. Okay, but you can have that done. Also, when we do not for sale, like I said, we do it simpler. Mm-hmm. The cutting is uh, the cutting is a little bit more simple. <laughs> And the labeling, we just have a, we just put a sticker on it. It's like rib roast or flank steak or something like that. Mm-hmm. Whereas when we do it under inspection, the uh, we do a lot more detailed cutting instructions, and there may be a number of more um, exotic cuts that we won't do because it takes us more time mm-hmm. for a lot of beef. And for example, pork sausage. If we do some hogs and make a lot of sausage for for a locker hog uh, for for custom, not for sale, it's just going to be sausage. Whereas when we label it, we, we've got for under inspection, we've got to put all of the ingredients in there. So 
It tells you, you know, salt, sugar, pepper, red pepper, sage, spices, things like that. The market ready programs were, you know, that this entity is part of is for direct marketing of the restaurant. What kind of markings or labels for tender inspections would meet me to be marketed to a restaurant for taste and sale? You've got to have USDA inspected. Okay. I just had a customer in here, and, and there was a misunderstanding. He said he didn't need to have the inspector. He wanted to have, he, he didn't want to pay for that extra inspection, and, and he wasn't going to sell the meat directly, but he was going to cook it in his kitchen, then sell some product that had came. I'm not sure if he was making lasagna or meat pie or something like that. He was trying to save some money. I told him, though, he, he absolutely had to have that market inspection on there because if it's in his refrigerator, mm -hmm. a health inspector came through, he's, he's got to be doing that in the inspected kitchen. They come and inspect it, and there's some meat in there without an inspection mark. He could get in, in big trouble for that. Mm -hmm. uh, or, at the very least, he, he risks the loss of all of that meat because they're going to make him dump it. They don't know where that meat comes from. He's going, wait a minute, here's my invoice from T&E. Came through there, you know, it was all well. I can't believe that because it doesn't have that market inspection on it. So, like the, the chefs, when they have the meat in their refrigerator, even though they're getting ready to cook it, they still it's going to be in a box or container that still has that market inspection. That market inspection has to follow the meat throughout the entire value chain up until the point where it's prepared and put out for sale, like in a restaurant. Okay. And I guess because you guys do lot numbers and a you know specific process for identifying, they're going to know not just where it's processed but when, so they have an idea of how long. It's yes, they'll have all that information, or if it's not on the package, we can give it to them because you're, you're correct. We do we do have a we do have lot numbers and tracking numbers. We have a we call it a TEID number. That's unique to every animal that we slaughter. One thing with restaurants, a lot of times the chefs are going to want the meat fresh. Mm -hmm. So then we've got to pay a lot more attention to timing and, you know, how, how much shelf life you're going to have. Because the majority of the meat that comes out of T&E is frozen. You still have to worry about shelf life a little bit with frozen meat, but not anywhere near like you do with fresh. Chefs have some specific, often very specific requirements and things that they want. And every one might be unique. If you're the farmer and you're trying to market to a chef, the best thing to do is to develop a relationship with the chef, try to understand what the chef wants. You can have the chef call us mm -hmm. if he wants to explain or she wants to explain exactly what they want. We've already talked some about the labeling that gets used based on like the market channel of the end user, but depending on who the end user is for a cut of meat, does the packaging change at all? Yeah, it does actually. We've got, particularly for ground product, because ground product takes a lot of handling. It can be time consuming for us. Our standard retail package is a, is a flat square vacuum pack. You can see it, you can pick it up, it, it stores nicely in your, in your freezer and you can see what it is. And it's very time consuming for us to do it. So we also have another way of packaging ground, say ground beef, where you've seen, everybody's seen those little packages of sausage, like Jimmy Dean sausage mm -hmm. with the little clipper ties. And we can, we can do about, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 of those one pound packages in the time it takes us to do a single one pound package of the flat pack. It's one tenth of production cost. So those are two different options. And recently we've got a, a roll stock machine, which is a very, you know, it's a hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment. And then we got to have another piece of equipment that goes on a grinder head and it produces all the ground beef and little, little loaves. And then you can put the loaf in the roll stock machine. But at the end of the day, you've got this beautiful package. It's like the flat pack, but it's even, if you go to the, to, um, I don't know, one of the big supermarkets today, you'll see these, that's been fairly customer. You see these little one pound bricks and that's, that's more rapid. So we've got like three different ways that, that we'll do it. Just, just on the ground beef side of things. If you do larger pieces, there's some different ways of packaging that, that we can that we can do more or less in the in in the small meat plant world it's vacuum packing 
the one of the biggest single complaints in the industry is loss due to blown seals on your vacuum packaging. People, th it's frozen, and and if they at the farmer's market, they may handle it multiple times, and it gets bounced around, and and then it gets a little micro puncture. And there's a thing that you can do we don't have this when you've got like a, a shrink wrap it's not going to come apart we don't have that technology that's that's another investment that maybe one day we'll make that may be a, a factor in somebody's decision as to which processing plant to go to because different processing plants are going to have different equipment they're going to have different capabilities at this point in time for example we don't do any further processing or value-added processing, i.e. cooking, curing, smoking. There may be another processor out there who has that capability, and that would be a reason why a farmer would make that choice as to who to go to. It's not just price. People tend to, I would just see your pricing sheet. Well, the best thing to do is to think win-win. You want to find a processor that you're going to be able to talk to relate to that understands what you need you guys are going to work together and get you the best possible result it's not just about money there's a little bit i found over the years i mean not being from the industry i haven't been here in the industry now for the last eight or nine years there's this adversarial sense or combativeness there's there's definitely out there there's a there is a lack of trust between the farming community and the processing community. You know, did I get my meat back and all of that? I think some of the reasons are understandable is because for one thing, it's just, it's a complicated business. People don't understand yields, carcass yields. You know, I've got, I've got this, this animal, I ran it over the scale, weighed 1200 pounds. How come I only got 400 or 450 pounds of meat back you stole some of my meat uh, no no we didn't that's what the yields are and you got to walk them through from the live weight to the to the rail weight or carcass weight and then you've got to walk them through the carcass weight down to the final cutting yield well, i love the customers that are willing to engage with me and develop a trust relationship with me and that we can understand each other because mm -hmm. my job is to make you successful Several of the meat producers that we've talked to, and some of them have been ones that you've worked with in prior interviews, have stressed the importance of selling the whole animal, particularly when you're dealing with a restaurant. Do you have any tips for growers on that that you've seen or for restaurants when it comes to using every piece of the animal? I understand the, the notion of selling the whole animal. Absolutely correct. Everything that you can do to minimize waste is, is critical. I, I think one of the things that, that, that's important is to find a good and creative chef that understands how to make use of everything. Not all of them can. Making making your own stock, using using the bones, finding a way to use organ meats, for example. Just do a little bit of curing in the kitchen so you can maybe make a little appetizer out of tongue or, or something with liver, uh, some sort of pate or something like that. The fellow I mentioned earlier buys whole lambs. Uh, I mean, that's the thing this guy will do. He uses everything. He knows mm -hmm. there's not a piece that goes to waste. And so that's a good thing to, to find that individual then and figure out how to, uh, you know, use all the bones, use the, the, the bad, use the awful. So many Chefs out there just, they, they want the best steak cuts. They, they want your filet, they want your ribeyes, and the rest of it's on you. And mm -hmm. so, so that's, that's really difficult. Actually, little grocery stores are starting to come in. We work with the Friendly City Food Co-op over here, and they buy whole animals. When they first started, they didn't have that much room, and, and they just sold beef and pork and lamb in a freezer case. But now they've got a hot food bar. So if there's anything that's going out of date, or there's something that's maybe less desirable on the case from the consumer, they know how to take that and to, and to create it to something wonderful and delicious, and you can go over and get a good lunch at their hot food bar. That's a pretty good thing. I, I think the most important thing is, is to be looking for uh, innovative, creative chefs that use the whole animal. That's that's part of the trick. I mean, you're the producer. You do the best you can to produce a good animal, but you can't dictate to somebody that they've got to take the whole. 
piece. I, I know some examples where the producer, who's a good marketer, might split it between two different restaurants. And now this restaurant over here is maybe more of a white tablecloth restaurant. And this restaurant over here is a breakfast or a burger joint. Yeah, you sell all the high-end steaks over here. The rest of it goes into ground beef over here. And you can make use of everything that way. So you got to hustle. you got to be a good marketer. Not all farmers are. So that's a constraint. So I saw on y'all's website that you guys have the Animal Welfare Approved Certification. You're a certified right. slaughterhouse. Can you kind of just walk us through a little bit of what that means and how it you know, what that means from the producer side as well. How do they get involved? It really matters from the producer side because they are the largest third-party certifier of humane handling, humane slaughter for mm -hmm. livestock in America. They focus on the producer side of things. They don't focus necessarily on the processor. But when the producer requests, uh, I couldn't just call them up and say, I want to be AWA certified. It's got to come from a farmer or a producer. We now, it's been many years, we've worked with beef. We're, we're certified beef, all the red meats. Once they're asked to come in, then they come in and they've got a whole engagement process. And it's really about humane handling. They want to know what happens to the animals from the moment they come onto the property until the moment they're on hanging up on the rail. How do we take care of them in the barn? What are our handling facilities? How do we move them up into the knockbox? Do they have slippage problems? Are we just zapping them with electric prods all the way along to get them up there? Or do we have proper facilities that they'll just naturally flow along and, and move? Do we know how to put pressure on an animal and since what that means is where you stand in relationship to the animal how close how far away because there's a, a lot of techniques to just let the animal know what you're expecting of it and they'll then they will just move right along do we know how to deal with stressful animals how do we know how to stun properly are we very attentive? Do we do a lot of training? Do we take good care of our equipment? Is everything working properly? So they, they want death with dignity. Uh, they want to see that the animal is treated respectfully. They don't want the animal to suffer at all. So they'll come in every year. We go through an audit. They send one of their very trained people. They'll spend a few days with us. And then they, so they watch everything we do and they, they watch all the different species. They've got a, a fairly complex set of formulas and things that they're checking. And there were a lot of items on that list that they thought we should address. Mm -hmm. And every year that list gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And it's it's pretty short now. But it, it, it's all sorts of things. Do they, are there any areas uh, where the animals slip? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the whole Temple Grandin thing, if, if anybody knows who Temple Grandin is, I'm sure many of your listeners are going to know that. Are there things that make the animal balk? Are there light conditions? Are there uh, puddles? Are there excessive noise areas? Do you shoot the animal? Do you... So with hogs, you know, when we first started, almost all of our slaughter was with a 22. Mm -hmm. And then we went to, we did some fixed bolt stunning. And then we went almost entirely to fixed bolt stunning. And now we actually, for hogs, we do electroshock stunning for a number of different reasons and, and again that's in line with Temple Grandin's thinking. So just to sum it up, the, the most important thing about AWA again is that trust factor. Mm -hmm. It's not just us saying that, that we do a good job or want to do a good job. It's somebody else out there who's got no skin in the game in terms of our business that's coming in and telling the consumer this farmer and this processor they're doing it right. What do meats that are bought directly from the farmer, what do they have to offer restaurants compared to meat from other sources? Well, I think, this is, this is my bias, mm -hmm. and this isn't true for every farmer. It's, it's not just that you get an animal out of a pasture and you take them to a small processor. But if the, process, if the, if the producer knows what they're doing, if they really take the time, they, they look at their animals, they look at their husbandry program, they look at their feeding program, nourishment, they look at their genetics, all that kind of thing. They care what they're doing. That meat is going to taste much better than boxed 
pork or box beef or what have you. Just to take the example of hogs, mm -hmm. we're just seeing an absolute explosion of interest in people that are doing free range hogs. You know, they're up in the forest eating acorns or they're out on pasture where they can have access to to good grasses and bugs and all that kind of thing. They eat, they eat the, uh, grain, but they also, they do a fair amount of foraging. Those hogs are typically the traditional heritage breeds. The industry doesn't want them because they aren't anywhere near as efficient. They don't, they don't, they produce a lot more fat, a lot less muscle. Uh, they take longer to grow up. You have to understand that uh, if you're buying pork at Food Lion, you are getting an animal that has been intensely bred for to be an industrial thing, you can take off a shelf and produce a certain amount of kind of pork chop and a certain amount of this and that. It's going to be, it's been bred for a long time to be very lean, have much less fat. It's kept in a, a confinement animal uh, shed, raised there its whole life, never sees daylight, never really breathes fresh air because they're, you know, they got huge fans blowing to keep the uh, ammonium ammonia out of the sewage lagoons from overwhelming the animals. I mean, the animals are literally going to die at certain times of the year if those fans aren't blowing 100%. Everything about that animal is kind of unnatural. And I understand why they do it. If you buy pork from my farmers, you're going to be paying a lot more. It's all about efficiency, driving down costs, maximizing production for a given amount of input and feed, what have you, land. That's their model, but the flavor, I mean, I go around once a year, I go out and buy, go into a grocery store and just buy all the, all the different sausages that they'll have and I take it home and cook it up. You know, I'll take some of ours and cook it and some of the sausage that we produce from all our different pro producers and, you know, they, they are all doing something different. They come from different parts of the state. They have different they have heritage breeds, but the natural materials are just so superior. It's just unbelievable. The difference is just it's night and day. The same with good lamb. The same with good beef. Used to every once in a while, I'd go down and, and buy a steak at the at a butcher counter at, at a grocery store, and because I was wanting a ribeye steak and they looked good and you know it was easy. I don't do that. It's been years since I've done that. To me, they they taste they taste like corn oil. Mm -hmm. uh, it tastes, you know, it's got that feed lot and it tastes very, it tastes uh, a little bit mushy. It doesn't really have a good firm texture. They're slaughtered very young, but who knows? Maybe they've been fed beta agonists or some of these other things that cause them to be feel tender, grow very fast, but it's not good for the animal. Maybe it's not good for you. If the producer knows what they're doing and they pay attention to everything, in my opinion, the meat is always going to be better. Okay. So, and if you're a restaurant and you're a chef and it's all about the flavor, why wouldn't you? If you can make it work from a price perspective. And it seems like there's a lot more nuance on the direct marketing side of it too. I know, you know, I've worked on kind of both sides of the equation growing up, you know, between the more conventional industrial production side mm -hmm. and the, you know, folks who are moving towards direct marketing. And in the in the production side of things, there's there's the idea of confirmation to a one size fits all so that somebody gets a gets a product and, you know, your consumer has an idea when they pull that pull that conventional steak right. out of the butcher counter, they have an idea of what they're getting. Right. Whereas from a chef's perspective, it seems like if you drill everything down to, you know, I'm selecting this specific heritage breed from this specific location where it's been farmed all the way through what cuts you want. It seems like you have a lot more chance for a nuance to fit that kind of flavor profile and that eventual dish that you want. Right. But you can also end up being frustrated because right. you don't necessarily have the predictability. One of the really good things about the industrial system and why people, why the, the industry has gone that way mm -hmm. is that it's same time every time. It's predictable. You can have consistent pricing, expectations. You can go to export, all of that. There's lots and lots of really good reasons why they've gone that way. But if you go to an industrial, if you go to a convention or you go to a class at Iowa State or something like that, they're going to talk about all of those things. They're going to talk about efficiency. They're going to talk about production. They're going to talk about consistency, understandability. They're going to talk about shelf life. The last thing you're going to hear them talk about, if they talk about it at all, is flavor. 
They're going to talk about consumer experience. Which is different. But they're not going to talk about flavor. Okay. They use those interchangeably, and I think they're talking about the same thing. They're not. Whether they know about it or not. Because consumer experience is, I got what I was expecting. You right. go to McDonald's and you get a sausage biscuit with egg. That darn little booger is maybe tastes good, and it's got, but it's going to taste the same way every single time, mm -hmm. and it's what you're expecting. If you, they suddenly substituted some of my really good heritage breed sausage and put it in there, maybe you wouldn't like it because the flavor might be better, but the pork might be softer, and it wasn't, mm -hmm. it didn't have the same crumble or mouthfeel or something like that. There's just a lot more variation with the local food stuff that can be a problem it's just part of the game you want that variation to be bouncing around in here whatever is bouncing around that from a say a flavor or enjoyment perspective if the industrial stuff there's no there's no fluctuation it's always the same mm -hmm. but then right here is the is the level of quality or flavor and up here you're bouncing around and you're always higher right you may yeah. be always different and not necessarily because every once in a while you're going to come down here and have a steak that tastes like swamp water because for whatever reason somebody's not really paying attention to what they're doing and again in the, in the processing plants it's the same thing in the local food there's lots of different processors or so small we're all doing things the way the best we can we may not have the most absolute modern facilities modern machinery modern sensors and stuff like that that all work in harmony to make everything exactly the same every single time you know, it's the trade-offs. There's always going to be some pluses and minuses. you got to take the time to look at the whole thing. Mm -hmm. and what are you trying to accomplish? Why? There's lots of reasons to go this way, and there may be some good reasons to go that way. Mm -hmm. Me, obviously, I've chosen to go uh, the local food route. I think you're going to find flavor is going to typically be better, not 100%. But a chef has got to... If, if you're in a restaurant, cash flow is everything. I'm, I'm a business guy. I own a business. I got a, I got payroll for 18 guys uh, coming out this Friday. I, so I understand that sometimes you've got to make choices that maybe you would rather not make. Mm -hmm. um, but you, because you've got to work within the parameters that your business allows you to do. So, but all things being equal, uh, I think a chef is always going to want to improve their flavor profile uh, right. of, of what they produce. That's why they do what they do, by and large, especially the good ones. You know, they're not in it necessarily. I mean, they want to make money, they want to be successful, but at the heart of it all, they 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 want they want a James Beard Award. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> they 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 want to be at the top of their game, and that's producing good eating food. You work with farmers all the time. What do you like about it? I'll get political here for just a little bitty, bitty moment. Mm -hmm. America's, we're at a strange moment. We're like, people are really divided. You know, it's red state, blue state, or, or what city, rural, or whatever. Right here is one of the places that everybody comes together. I work with all kinds of people. I work with traditional farmers. I work with hippie farmers that are back to the landers, or people that do it. I was a... You know, I was a vegan for years, and then I realized I could raise my own meat, and I could treat the animal well, you know, and come to an AWA certified plant, and now life is good again. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just crazy. It's You just work with all kinds of people. They come in from the hills of West Virginia, and they come from the suburbs of Charlottesville and, and Washington, D.C. I had a guy dropped off the most beautiful Hereford bull a few years back it was a phd he didn't he wasn't a farmer per se he had raised a few animals this beautiful animal he hugged that thing. it was his pet he hugged it and walked away with tears and he run down his face but he said goodbye i gotta do this you know you see people from all walks of life and with all different motivations they love the animals i, I give tours pretty regularly I, I feel education is part of my mission i've taken homeschoolers classes from JMU and from UVA, folks from all over. Yeah, but I make them go on the kill floor. I won't give them a tour unless they make that part of it because I want them to see everything that we do. 
and they f- often find some people can't they they can't be there and they walk out and that's fine. But most people find it a pretty profound experience that they don't know what to expect at all. And I think right. they are a little surprised at the people they meet working on that kill floor. You know, and I always tell them, you know, my people love animals. They they kill animals, but they love animals, and it's a weird paradox. You know, they love having animals in their life. They love working with them. They love seeing them. They love eating them. They love hunting them. They love having them as pets and raising them. Just they embrace it from all perspectives. And I always tell the story of there was one individual that worked my knockbox for several years. He was my stunner that stunned the animals. But he also was, had a dog who was inseparable with, was his little chihuahua thing, a little bitty thing. He actually delivered that animal by cesarean section. Mother had died. The, pre, the pup that came ahead of it was a breech birth, and they both died in the process. He came out of the house, found them, realized that there was another one alive in it, used a penknife to, to deliver that little pup. And his daughters raised it with little baby bottles, and that little that, that little puppy never never left his side. And, and that's a story I tell people because it mm-hmm. just shows you both sides of it. They a lot of people think of just the negative. I mean, you're taking that animal's life. How can you do that? Well, because that animal gives us life. It, it's illustrative of, of of everything that that we do. Why I like working with all the different farmers. I mean, people come for. They come from about three hours drive around, so I, I talk with them. You know what the weather is and what they're raising out in the northern neck. Mm-hmm. You know what's going on down south of Lynchburg and Roanoke. You know what's happening back up in the mountains to the west of us. You you kind of got your feelers out into the geography. And like I say, I was a landscape architect and uh, and a planner, and I love landscapes and just like to just see how it's all coming together. So it's great. We were very grateful for the opportunity to hear Joe's perspective as a meat processor. He brought not just his experiences in the field to the table, but those of all the producers he works with. Many thanks to Joe for his time and for being so generous with his knowledge. We're Virginia Market Ready, helping you get your food from the field to the fork.